Hi, this is Daniela Cambone. Welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show. Joined today by the best-selling author of The Great Silver Bull, Peter Krauth. He's also the editor behind uh, the silver-focused investment newsletter, uh, silverstockinvestor.com. Peter, uh, so good to be back with you. I see you're joining me from my hometown of Montreal. Welcome. Thank you so much, Daniela. Always a pleasure to be back with you. Look, you are one of the silver gurus out there. So obviously we're going to talk silver, we're going to talk gold, but I thought it'd be fun, Peter, to just start with where we are at today, because I believe the last time we spoke was exactly a year ago. We were both in Zurich for a conference and we were right in the middle of Credit Suisse's downfall. We were in the midst of the beginning of the banking crisis. And you know, what a, what a place we were really in the, in, in the heart of the matter. Uh, I kind of want to ask you, Peter, one year later, have we become complacent to banks failing here? I think so, Daniela. Absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously black swans are by definition unpredictable. But if you look at what some of the bigger risks, outlying risks there are out there uh, for the U.S. and for the the global economy, I think that um, overextended banks really is one of those. Here's an interesting statistic. It took during the great financial crisis, it took over two years and it took something like 220 banks to reach about $500 billion in losses. Last year, it took five U.S. banks to reach that same amount and it took a matter of perhaps a month. So (laughs) the concentration is scary. The acceleration is scary. And I think people really do need to, uh, to pay attention to those risks. Absolutely. And and let's talk about, um, you know, the metals now and how they're responding. I mean, obviously, since we've spoken, we've seen such a run up in, in, in gold, obviously in silver, but gold making new all time highs. I mean, how much of the fear of the banks do you think is helping the gold rally right here, Peter? I would think it's certainly a factor. Um, and, you know, one of the questions I keep getting is, is this is this really going to be sustained? And frankly, one of the interesting right. indicators is to look at what happens with with currencies versus gold, for example. And you typically can have uh, a more sustained gold rally. You can have more confidence in the rally if it's happening in all the major currencies. There was one holdout. Now, a few weeks back, we had all time highs in, in gold and that, you know, consisted uh, or stayed consistent for, for several days, a week. In fact, the last holdout was the, the Swiss franc, uh, oddly enough. And we had that a few days ago. We had a breakout and to an all-time high in the Swiss franc. So now that we have that, we have a sort of you know one uh, big indicator that we can that this this breakout's likely to be sustained and to lead on to to newer highs. Now let me ask you, Peter, because you know the silver investor is going to say, Peter, we've been hearing this for so long. We've been hearing you know talk of triple-digit silver for so long. We've been patient. How do we know this time it's different? I mean, you know, if you look at the silver market, it it really is gradually becoming more of an an industrial metal. We're already now at about 60 percent of of, uh, consumption or or demand going towards uh, industry. But that just makes uh, the um, uh, in other words, more silver being consumed by industry leaves less silver available for investment. So I think that when you get the investment demand really kick in. To really kick in, that's when um, you're going to have uh, an even bigger uh, effect from that because you simply have less silver being made available for investment. A lot of it is uh, getting consumed, and as we know, uh, you know, follow the silver industry, consume silver uh, by industrial the industrial side. Very, uh, very little of that ends up getting recycled just because uh, so much is used in small quantities and the cost to recycle is doesn't justify the um, the the pursuit of, of, of getting the silver back out and, and back into the market. So, um, you know, there are different things. I, I have uh, a theory of, as to why the silver price has sort of been seen capped for the last few years. And um I think that's only going to last for a little while longer. Uh, and and uh, it's a question of really secondary inventories and, and where they're going and how much of that is actually left. So talk to me. What is your theory of why so, it's kept the, the... Absolutely. So if you look at 
Um, you know, you've got really two sides to the to the investment demand. Or sorry, to to overall demand. You've got industrial, and then you've got um, investment demand. Anything beyond that, so that's sort of let's say when in a year where you have a silver surplus, uh, goes into secondary inventories that gets stashed into the futures markets, it goes into silver ETFs, for example, and it accumulates there. But in the last four years, we've had deficits and structural deficits in the silver market. So, you know, a, a structural deficit doesn't mean that the consumers, especially the industrial consumers, are not getting their silver. They're still getting it from somewhere. And it, it, mo the most obvious source is that they're getting it from these secondary inventories. So if you look at the major um, the major futures markets and the ETFs. So the major futures markets would be the COMEX, the LBMA and Shanghai, and then the, the global e silver ETFs. You see something really interesting. So the pattern is for the last four years, those inventories have been steadily drawing down. And if you look at overall inventories in, in, the, three, uh, in the three futures markets, they're down about 40%. Now, inventories are not all available for delivery. It's only what we call registered silver in those markets that's available for delivery. And the registered silver is actually down closer to 70% in the last three to four years. And, you know, I do obviously my own proprietary research on, on the silver side. And if you look at the silver ETFs, like I say, they've seen their um, their inventories gradually fall. Now, SLV is the world's largest silver ETF. And if you go back to inception, which was 2006, there has not been until the last few years, there has not been a sustained period where if the silver price was either rising or going sideways, that their holdings, so the, the quantity of silver backing that ETF was actually falling. That's never happened. It's only started to happen in the last few years. So prior to that, even if you had big corrections in the silver price, you would see very small and very temporary drops in their silver inventories. Now in the last few years, you've seen something like 30 to 40% drop in, in the silver that backs uh, the SLV and, and silver ETFs globally. So, so bottom line is this, I think that in both the, the futures uh, markets, and with the silver ETFs, you have large players who go in, who, who need to consume the silver, are buying long futures contracts, standing for delivery when those mature, and or buying silver ETFs and trading in their units for, uh, for the physical silver, taking delivery. Well, to your point, Peter, I mean, I just read that hedge funds are starting to take an interest in silver as it could be the next major uh, momentum play. Uh, at least that's what they're seeing in the precious metals market. A CFTC report showed money managers increased their speculative uh, gross long positions in COMEX silver futures by, you know, 7,900 contracts to, you know, close to 54,000 for the week ending March 19th. At the same time, short positions fell uh, close to 3,400 contracts to about 16,000. So uh, hedge funds are noticing silver, preferring silver over gold, would you say right now? I mean, the setup certainly is more compelling. That's that's how I, I view it. I think that the nimble ones are, are noticing um, that structural deficit and the tightness. I mean, an in, interesting note. So I was at a conference just a month ago talking to a large silver producer that sells part of its production to uh, China and part of it to the West. And they said that the market is so incredibly tight that the Chinese are asking them for the silver. They're asking them to lock in their deliveries weeks in advance. They're willing to pay them in advance and they're willing to pay them $3 over spot to get the silver. So they really absolutely want the silver. And, um, and I, and I think, as I say, it's just uh, right now, it's more, it's more compelling. Obviously gold has done well and it's going to continue to do well, but you know, gold at all time highs, probably is, is sort of more fairly valued if you look at money supply, if you look at risk of recession, if you look at inflation, et cetera. Silver really is the outlier and has tr just tremendous potential at this point. So speaking of people who really want silver, I know you've done extensive research uh, looking at Turkey, looking at Egypt. I mentioned Turkey, obviously inflation spiraling out of control. There's 67% people obviously looking uh, for 
things outside of, of the money system, Peter. But talk exactly. to me about your findings, which I find uh, extremely interesting coming from Turkey and Egypt. Yeah. So, so Turkey, as you said, um, something like 65, 67% annual inflation. The price of silver in Turkey, the Turkish lira, has, uh, is up seven times in the last three years. And then you have Egypt, where um, gold is traditionally being used as a gift for uh, newlywed brides, uh, for newborns. And they're saying in Egypt, silver is the new gold. They're turning to, to silver instead because they're finding it too expensive. The price of silver has uh, has doubled in the past couple of years in in, uh, in Egypt. So, you know, that shows how the demand really is is shifting. And you have uh, India has, uh, has seen its imports of silver soaring. Turkey has seen its imports of silver soaring. Um, really, uh, this is sort of staying under the radar, I think, for a little while. But it's going to change. I, I, I even put, you know, together um, uh, for for my uh, my presentation in, in a recent uh, in a recent conference. I looked at what some of the the dynamic was in terms of uh, forecasts and then eventual um, actual results. So. I call it the silver 2023 realities. The supply forecast for silver was that uh, it was actually going to grow in 2023 by 2%. In fact, it fell by 2%. Industrial demand thought they thought it was going to grow by 4%. It was revised. The growth was revised up 8%. Solar demand was forecast to be 140 million ounces of silver last year. It was revised to 190 million ounces. And then the supply deficit for 2023 was forecast at 142 million ounces. And then they revised that to 194 million ounces. These are really big misses. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's very much um, off. I think that the market is very much being underestimated. And I think the pressure on the price uh, from the supply that these industrial users are able to get from this, these secondary inventories that I explained earlier, that's got a limited life. If I had to guess, I'd say 12, 18 months. Um, anything could happen in the meantime. But if nothing you know, explosive happens to silver before then, which, which I certainly doubt, but if it did, um, I think that's, that's going to be the limit of these secondary supplies. And the gold-silver ratio telling, is telling us basically silver's still cheap. Yeah, and so is Robert Kiyosaki reminding us of this. <laughs> if you follow Robert, you know. I do. Love silver absolutely. for being so cheap right now. You bet. You uh, bet. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, you know, um, people need to understand the silver market. It is, uh, it's its own animal. Uh, and I like to see silver is a patience trade. It's kind of like Bitcoin and uranium. And if you look at what happened to both of those assets in the last few years, they just moved sideways, 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 and then exploded higher. If you look at the last sort of, um, I guess I'm going to say two quarters. So about the last two quarters of both, uh, uh, the last quarter of 2023, the first quarter of 2024, approximately, both of those assets doubled um, in price. And so it took a matter of, of months before that happened. I see silver doing something similar. When it exactly that will, you know, and what will the trigger be? Hard to say. But, you know, I have an interesting quote from uh, someone, a lot of people who follow this space know Rick Rule. He said, the silver market, uh, the silver equity market resembles that of uranium in 2022. It's stupidly cheap. And so, I mean, I could, I could hardly agree more. And, you know, Peter, I know you don't like giving forecasts, but the people want to know. <laughs> when, you, when you're saying you're bullish silver, where could you see yeah. it going? And go I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess... A, a relatively conservative forecast is that for the first half of this year, we could see it breach 26, which if you look at, you know, sort of technically, that seems to be a bit of a ceiling. I think it's going to breach that in the next few months, this next quarter. Um, and then once we breach that in a meaningful way, I think that's going to start to become a new floor. And so we're going to really see it stay above 26. And I think in the second half of this year, we could easily see $28, maybe better. But for now, I'm willing to say we'll see probably 28 uh, before the year is out. And gold? Gold, um, my goodness. At this point, I think that 
this year we're going to probably see 2,500. I think that that becomes realistic. And, yeah. uh, you know, an interesting thing I, I came across, it's not just, <laughs> you know, it's not just consider- conspiracy theorists and, uh, and hard asset lovers that, that are turning to gold. Um, there was, there was some big news a few days ago, Bank of Japan finally raised rates first time in 17 years. That apparently is a, uh, a foolproof indicator of global recession whenever that happens. So, you know, I, I think that's likely. I, I'm very much um, in that camp. We're going to see recession globally, at least in, in major uh, economies. But what really shocked me was an interesting headline about, and this from Dow Jones, okay, headline from Dow Jones saying that um, the, uh, the Government Pension Investment Fund of Japan, which is the world's largest, is now starting to look at what they call illiquid assets. So, I mean, Danielle, I don't know who writes these headlines, but it's the most ridiculous thing. Illiquid assets. They're looking at things like um, gold, Bitcoin, and they call them illiquid assets. I think that's just the most, well, first, it's interesting that they're looking at these assets, which they typically don't hold. So that tells you really something in terms of where they see inflation going. But then to call them illiquid assets, I mean, doesn't this, doesn't this, you know, writer have a um an editor no. that looks at that and says <laughs> you know makes no sense not not that the editor would necessarily know different but that right. just shocked me i thought that just yeah. ridiculous. i think unfortunately um there's a lot of weak journalists out there peter and who really yep. don't understand this market at all and then you just get these sloppy headlines but such a good point sure on japan because uh, i've been hearing that from more than one source so we're going to be following that story closely uh, because like they've been telling me, that could really be the butterfly effect that would just affect uh, the global monetary system. Exactly. Peter exactly. Krauth, always good catching up with you. Get his book, The Great Silver Bull. I didn't want to mess that up. The Great Silver <laughs> Bull. And you were like killing it on Amazon, right? It's one of oh, the best absolutely. sellers. It's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, um, it's interesting that uh, about a year ago, or a little less than a year ago, I was uh, offered by a German publisher to uh, publish the book in German. And so it's now available in German and uh, they're doing really well with the sales. Um, You know, the the regular versions, uh, the audio version, everything is really, you know, uh, adding up and people are interested. So it's a good sign. I'm I'm really happy to see great feedback. I'm happy for you. You deserve it, Peter. And we'll see you soon. Maybe I'll see you in Montreal. (laughs) (laughs) I look forward to it. Thanks for coming on and thank you all for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way. So be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni show only on ITM trading. And don't forget to sign up to stay on top of it all at DanielaCamboni.com. And another reminder, if you haven't booked your Calendly session, it's a, you just book a calendar appointment with one of my associates over at ITM trading to basically set up a free strategic session um, uh, to go over the topics we're covering or your money, you know, what to do with it, how to protect yourself given the environment. It's just a really great uh, experience. So do that. We'll see you soon.